Hello, everybody. Uh, we'll give it a few more minutes before we start just to see if anybody else is going to show up. <clears throat> Otherwise, we'll get started about uh, just a couple of minutes after seven. All right, I've got my trusty water to avoid the uh, horse voice, so let's get rolling. So tonight we're going to be talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be talking about dangerous attitudes. Um, from the picture that you see here, not exactly just that. We're going to talk uh, first a bit about uh, accident trends and how they relate specifically with uh, what the Federal Aviation Administration refers to as hazardous attitudes. So we're going to relate, we're going to draw some conclusions from uh, hazardous attitudes and how they can contribute, of course, to circumstances that lead to actual dangerous attitudes, actual dangerous attitudes, uh, specifically, uh, as we kind of see here, and we're going to get into spatial disorientation in conjunction with that. So we'll get into what is spatial disorientation, some illusions that lead to spatial disorientation, and then we'll get into uh, something called UPT, UPRT or Upset Prevention and Recovery Training, which most of you, uh, if not all of you, have already done uh, some uh, UPRT or uh, maybe a lot of it. Uh, but there's always more to learn in regards to that. So let's jump in. Let's talk first of all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get some water here. Let's talk about uh, a feedback system that when when an accident or incident occurs specifically in relation to loss of control and largely loss of control accidents they're our main focus usually general aviation i think not just usually but i think every single year the ntsb or the Nas national transportation safety board puts out a top 10 most wanted list and ga is usually uh, uh I, I guess i should say is always on that top 10 most wanted list for loss of control accidents, uh, pretty much year in and year out. But there is this element in play that leads to hazardous attitudes where <clears throat> it's kind of like a rolling snowball, or in this case, it's a, a system that actually builds upon itself. We're gonna have to kind of delve into that when we get into things a little bit uh, down the road here. But the idea is, is if we were to look look at you know someone's practices um both pre-flight and in flight then what we see happening is you know pre-flight we see things like incomplete or missing uh, weather briefings um no establishment of personal minimums or improper establishment personal minimums maybe maybe too uh uh too um headstrong and their ability or you know too too much in their abilities uh compared to where they actually are mismanagement of risk especially when it comes to external pressures uh being uh being uh, pressured emotionally to perform for someone or show off or give someone some confidence that you really know what you're doing and therefore going when you you, you shouldn't go that of course actually leads to situations where oftentimes you're going to get away with it um if you've not heard of the old saying, there's an old there's a saying called "big sky effect." That that in fact there's a lot of uh, a lot of leeway, a lot of uh, a give in many regards. So 
in flight, we have no re a reevaluation of uh, the decision that's been made. It's a single decision and whatever happens, happens. Um, over time, as people obtain their license, they don't necessarily grow in skills. Lots of times they deteriorate in their skills because going point A to point B, if there's not much evaluation of the flight, it's just kick the tires and jump in the airplane and go from point A to point B. Uh, and then there's no post-flight evaluation of what they did right, what they did wrong, how they can improve. Then you usually actually see a deterioration of skills in many regards, not, not across the board necessarily, but, but there is holistically, you could say a deterioration of skills. And they oftentimes get themselves into undesired aircraft states. Now we're not going to go into that specifically, but, just generally what that means is situations either where the airplane literally is not properly configured or where the airplane uh, shouldn't be necessarily location wise or a set of circumstances irrespective all of those elements can combine we can kind of just generalize that as a a statement of undesired aircraft states but it's with lucky outcomes and when we don't when we say lucky we're not saying like lucky is in rolling a snake eyes we're just saying luck is in your in your favor you know uh the odds are in your favor so but it's still ultimately lucky because you could have rolled uh uh you know something undesired that could have led to a, a mishap or an accident but the point is is then uh a certain level of arrogance comes into play with because they're not self-evaluating they're not realizing the mistakes they made um because they're not thinking about those they're just saying oh we, we got here you know uh, it was a successful outcome and so that leads to enhanced risk and so you could even see that maybe they were fairly disciplined when it came to pre-flight but then they had these experiences in flight with no no self-evaluation post-flight then it actually feeds back into pre-flight practices becoming deteriorated deteriorated pre-flight practices deteriorate to to further uh worsening performance in flight and so you can see that this can lead to an enhanced risk slash uh, hazardous attitudes. Um, before we jump into hazardous attitudes, yep, same thing we, we've seen before. Just want to reiterate, uh, we're going to talk specifically, of course, in this case, weather is a, a big contributing factor, but not the only contributing factor when it comes to uh, specifically upset uh, attitude situations, what we're going to particularly relate to with hazardous situations like unusual attitudes. Uh, no doubt we can see for sure VFR flight into IMC is uh, definitely got the lion's share uh, of uh, both total accidents, but also fatal accidents. We can see that, again, according to the 27th Joseph T. Now report, which are the, as I get to think was uh, 2015's data, um, we see, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 20, uh, 20 uh, VFR into flight. Uh, sorry, v VFR and IMC uh, fatal accidents and 21 total with one non-fatal accident. So it's it's no joke. It's definitely the real deal. It's something to be avoided. Uh, and there's many ways, of course, to avoid it. It's not like, again, this just reach up, reaches up and grabs you out of the air. Uh, there's lots of circumstances usually leading to this. In direct correlation, if we move on to the next slide, we can see that, sure enough, when it comes to maneuvering, loss of control, uh, whether that stalls or whether that's a stall that leads to an unusual attitude or an unusual attitude due to spatial disorientation, uh, it also has the lion's share when it comes to types of maneuvering accidents as far as total numbers and certainly also fatal numbers with what, 22 fatal accidents, 24 total, so we had two non-fatal in 2015. So um, we're definitely going to approach this from the standpoint of learning uh, about these elements and of course how we can avoid uh, those types of situations happening to us but also be aware that no doubt this is in uh, the airman certification standards whether you're a private pilot applicant or a commercial applicant uh, or a commercial slash CFI applicant even uh, some instrument stuff will certainly be discussed uh, also as well um, so we're going to jump into the ACS in just a moment, but before we do, some of the things that we're specifically going to, of course, want to emphasize is during pre-flight, uh, you've probably seen that this has been discussed before, but establishing good ADM principles. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that's going to relate specifically to being aware of hazardous attitudes. We're going to take a look at an extreme example. 
um, but we're also going to look at more subtle things as well. Risk assessment and mitigation, uh, hopefully you're getting familiar with that by now. Thorough weather briefing, obviously, uh, alternate plans of action established. In flight wise, we're looking at continuous reevaluation of the flight or the plan, uh, being able to utilize resources inside and, inside and outside the aircraft, i.e. specifically ATC, how to make sure that you're communicating with them, uh, and of course, always considering turning back. That sounds simple, but remember for lots of pilots, we're goal oriented, turning back is oftentimes considered a failure for the whole purpose of why we set out to fly in the first place. Emotionally, it's much more difficult to do than practically. Um, so make sure at the end of today, if, if you come away with nothing else, I want to make sure that you understand the importance of situational awareness as we see over on the far right hand side in comparison to spatial awareness. And then lastly, hazardous attitudes and uh, external pressures that are associated with uh, hazardous attitudes uh, oftentimes. So before we jump any further though, let's just give this some validity that again, yes, we're here ultimately to make sure that we're becoming better and safer pilots, but is this in fact going to be, uh, of course, on a progress check? Yes, no, no doubt it's absolutely gonna be on a progress check. So let's jump over to the, um, uh, to the ACS in four flight. So give me just a second because my iPad's frozen. Come on. It is not cooperating. So while I restart this, let's go on to the next slide. And uh, let's talk about uh, some hazardous attitudes. So you've probably seen these before if you haven't yes they sound like they're common sense uh however uh when emotion gets involved uh they're less so in real life situations so just to name them off to start we've got uh <clears throat> anti-authority impulse All right, can y'all hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, my iPad froze, so I had to restart there. All right, so let's uh, let's pick up, hopefully, let's see if I can get my iPad to share properly now. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So as I was saying, we're gonna jump into the ACS and take a gander just at, what it specifically says that we're expected uh, when it comes to uh, these ideas that we're going to talk about. So we'll jump into the private pilot ACS. However, again, commercial applicants, it's pretty much the same thing. Instrument rating uh, still can be applicable, but certainly when it comes to uh, spatial disorientation, no brainer. The things we're going to be talking about spatial disorientation wise, absolutely uh, expect to possibly be, be discussed on uh, the end of course as well so when we get into human factors the specific areas that we're going to be uh focusing on tonight is as we can see one of the knowledge elements when it comes to human factors is the applicant demonstrates understanding of the symptoms as applicable recognition causes effects and corrective actions associated with air medical and physiological issues including and it, for us tonight we're specifically going to focus on d spatial disorientation however before we get there 
we can see under risk management, the applicant also demonstrates the ability to identify, assess, and mitigate risks encompassing hazardous attitudes. So that's what we're getting into now is discussing these hazardous attitudes. Now, um, we're going to read some directly from the POTS handbook of aeronautical knowledge, but before I do that, let's jump back over to the, uh, the slide that I had up and um, talk about that, talk about a couple of things uh, as we list them off. So in this case, um, as I was apparently trying to get to work, uh, we can see that just listing them off over on the right-hand side, we can see anti-authority, impulsivity, invulnerability, macho, and resignation. When you read these on a piece of paper, they seem like they're common sense. And, and largely, to be honest, they are. But the complication is in real-life scenarios, emotion is going to come into play. Uh, external pressures can oftentimes pressure us into one of these uh, mentalities. Or more commonly, they're learned uh, over time, subconsciously almost, uh, to where they kind of turn into an automatic response that has snuck into our way of thinking, even if it's, like I said, it's not intentional. So the solution to these provided to us by the Federal Aviation Administration is some type of verbalized antidote. When I first read these, when I was uh, training, I kind of thought it was kind of a cheesy way of solving the problem. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've gone through things, uh, it actually is the best way, even if, if especially if you're not verbalizing in exact wording what the, uh, the antidote is. So let's just talk about these real quickly. Of course, anti-authority obviously is a belief that the, the Federal Aviation Administration or those put in tar charge of you are either too cautious or are just trying to, you know, restrict what you'd like to do, uh, something of that nature, right? Impulsivity is where we do things, well, impulsively, but specifically it's where we do things without much consideration to the possible consequences of that action. In fact, it's kind of the exact opposite of what we talk about when we talk about risk management or specifically aeronautical decision-making. That before we make a decision, we go through a systematic process of making sure that the best decision is in fact what we're gonna utilize. Invulnerability, obviously the idea that it's not gonna to happen to you, it happens to everyone else, but not you. Macho is the, of course, the, the bravado that's oftentimes associated with, with pilots. There's nothing wrong with having a certain level of confidence and even ego for some pilots, but when it turns into a dangerous situation, which we can see that prevail even in, in levels, of course, across the board, irrespective, of what type of pilot we're talking about, that can no doubt get people into situations where they're in over their head, where once again, they've, they've, they've got less skill than they think they do. And this is actually very common in relationship also to, uh, to upper level training, uh, specifically what we talked about shortly before, like upset uh, prevention and recovery training. Beyond what we're going to, of course, talk about tonight, and certainly beyond what we're going to do in the airplane, we're talking about, um, inverted dives, um, uh, rolled 140 degrees, nose down type situations, flat spins, uh, things like that. Lots of times, many pilots will say, I don't need that training because I believe my skill set allows me to rise to that occasion if it ever happened to me. But statistically speaking, we see that most people sink to the level of their training. So wherever their training is, that's where they're going to end up. And so machoism is kind of the for me, it's kind of the, the, the break between understanding where you really are skill-wise in comparison to where you think you are. Resignation is actually one of the most insidious, in my opinion, because it kind of separates with the other four. The other four usually would associate perhaps with more like a, an alpha personality, a headstrong person, uh, whereas resignation kind of goes to the other side. And it, it, unfortunately, it still is dangerous. So perhaps this person doesn't have as much confidence. Um, and so they're resigned to whatever decision they made is either gonna work or it's not gonna work. So how do we deal with these? Well, let's jump back over to the POTS Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. <clears throat> Take a look at um, the, the uh, specific section on that. Just discussing them shortly. Hopefully my iPad doesn't freeze this time. There we go. Um, I know I had the list up, but as per usual, I want people to make sure that they of course, understand the basic workings of uh, any manual. So we are gonna to go to the table of contents. 
uh, I am terrible at using the table of contents, so I'm going to force myself to do it so that uh, you, of course, can yourself. So what we're looking for, obviously, is, is a hazardous attitude. So if we go to chapter two, we can see that's definitely going to be our aeronautical decision making. And in conjunction, we can see listed under hazard and risk. We've got hazardous attitudes and antidotes starting on 2-4. So let's scroll over to that. Okay, so here are the antidotes given to us by the Federal Aviation Administration. So with anti-authority, uh, the, the simple phrase is don't tell me what to do. Uh, the antidote is follow the rules, they are usually right. Um, what you need to do for these to work, because you're not gonna really struggle with this right now. Uh, most people are gonna struggle with one of these hazardous attitudes at either a minor level or a major level across the entirety of their flight career. So think about what possibly could happen to you five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Think about how might you might be uh, skill-wise certainly differently, but how you might feel differently about flying as a whole. So consider these important to be applicable, not just now, but certainly in the future as well. Um, so follow the rules, they're usually right. Internalize that to something that of course would apply to you. And it may not come immediately, but as time goes on, I'll give you an example of something that I usually uh, use uh, a little bit uh, later that actually works. So if that phrase doesn't work for you, be aware that the antidote, even if it's not the exact same wording, still applies when you actually internalize that and turn that into a conviction. That's really what the antidote is supposed to do. It's supposed to become a conviction to make sure that you check yourself before making a decision with one of these hazardous attitudes or a multitude of these hazardous attitudes. Impulsivity, uh, of course, doing it quickly without thought to the consequences. Well, we are not catching a break today. Okay, hold on. We might have to wing this a little bit. Let me try sharing it one more time, and then if it fails, then I'm just gonna have to restart my iPad. I think that might be the <clears throat> the problem. Um, all right. So moving on, though, invulnerability. Uh, sorry, impulsivity. Not so fast. Think it first. Make sure that uh, <laughs> exactly. Make sure that you're thinking about what that possibly could uh, could cause before you make that decision. Especially if we're talking about an association with dealing with an actual problem or circumstance that's come up during the flight. Um, we're not going to get into the decide acronym tonight. Again, when I was doing my training, I memorized the DECIDE acronym. If you're not familiar with it, you don't really need to know it to get the concept across. But the DECIDE acronym is basically just a, an acronym that associates with, with aeronautical decision making. And so I memorized the DECIDE acronym and, okay, I've got it memorized. I guess I'm a better pilot now. And that's not it. The DECIDE acronym is simply just a memory aid to make sure you recall the steps associated with making good decisions. Um, and there are some steps in there that lots of pilots miss especially if they're moving through things impulsively. So the key takeaway, of course, with impulsivity is making sure that you consider the circumstances, you consider what kind of consequences are going to possibly be associated with one decision or one action or another before you make that decision. Um, and vulnerability, obviously, uh, this one I think is a little bit more insidious. I think it's a little more subconscious uh, that oftentimes we find ourselves just acting with invulnerability because surely it's not going to happen to me but the reality is it could happen um, this is a, a perfect example of uh, a situation where maybe you've done something countless times and it's never happened the way you were told it's possibly going to happen in training and so it becomes tiresome to do the same thing over and over and over again when you've never actually seen what you're doing is keeping you safe. And I'll, I'll come up with an example a little bit later, but the key element with invulnerability is to stay disciplined and realize, yes, despite me checking this 500 times before, if I don't check it today, it could be the one time that in fact there's a problem with it. So absolutely it could happen to me. Macho again, as we already talked about extensively, uh, taking chances is foolish, believing too much in your abilities beyond what your actual abilities are, be aware of that limitation. And of course, lastly, resignation. Don't give up. You're not helpless. You've got resources available to you. Use them. 
So those are our hazardous attitudes. Um, they're not as simple as they appear on paper. They're more complex, as I said, when you get into real life scenarios. So the more you're aware of this, especially when you can actually apply it to you as opposed to what you see on paper, the better uh, off you're going to be. All right, so let's jump back to our slides and get into uh, an extreme example, but uh, one that of course kind of gets this point across. <laughs> In our training environment, we're usually of course seeing good examples of things. We're gonna discuss a bad example. So this is the uh, NTSB uh, initial narrative or analysis on an accident that happened near uh, Alma, Georgia in 2015 in a, uh, an RV-10, which is uh, an experimental aircraft. Uh, of course, this happened under 91. Uh, injuries were five were fatal. So let's just read together here, starting from the top. The non-certificated pilot owner departed in his four-seat amateur built airplane in dark night conditions with four passengers on board. Radar data and a witness account indicated that the airplane was performing climbs, descents, and S turns at low altitude before the accident. The radar data indicated that climb and descent rates reached over 2,500 feet per minute. The witness described the airplane flying just above the trees and up and down in an M pattern with smooth increase and decreases in engine power until it disappeared from view and the engine sound ceased. Examination of the airplane revealed no evidence of mechanical malfunctions or anomalies and the accident site was consistent with impact at full engine power at a high rate of descent. The pilot had a history of disregard for established rules and regulations. He operated the accident airplane for years without a pilot certificate. He was arrested on three separate occasions, few of those within the four months before the accident for operating vehicles under the influence of alcohol. His contempt for rules and regulations as illustrated in his operation of service vehicles and accident airplane is consistent with an attitude of anti-authority which the Phil Aviation Administration considers hazardous to safe operation of aircraft. Um, I can go on. I think everybody kind of gets the point. This is an extreme example. And you may think it's actually a poor example because it's like, that, I would never do that. And, and rightly so. Most of us, I would hope all of us, would not even come anywhere close to how reckless the situation was. But what I do bring up is... Um, what happens to most of us is something a little more insidious. Um, for me, for example, um, I obviously could not begin to have an even remote idea of how many times I've sumped fuel from an airplane or drained fuel from a, an airplane to test it. Um, so I've been flying since, let's see, 90, 98, 99. Um, over that period, I have found water or contamination in airplanes that I could count on two hands. So it doesn't happen that often. Uh, and there's been many times where I've been tempted to impulsively jump in the airplane because I'm running late. So my antidote in those situations has always been, you can kind of see how, even though this, this author here in this NTSB uh, report is not outright calling this person terrible they're they're kind of just saying wow this person was extremely reckless right um in a very in a very appropriately technical way um and so what i always remind myself is okay if i if i'm in a rush and i don't think there's going to be any water in the fuel tanks today i do it anyways because i don't want someone at the ntsb making fun of me and that sounds like a ridiculous solution but it works for me that i don't want to be posthumously made fun of by someone at the ntsb uh, in other words, it works for it as an antidote to my impulsivity sometimes when I don't want to check the fuel. And therein lies, of course, the element of invulnerability as well. But a lot of things you guys are doing, you're going to have to stay disciplined in doing because it's not an issue of likelihood. It's very unlikely you're going to have water in the tanks. But how severe could it be if you did have water in the tanks and you didn't check? So that's the key takeaway with a lot of these situations is it's not likely to happen to you, but it could. And so in association, you maintain that discipline, trusting that if you do that every single time, you're not ever gonna get to see the bad side of those circumstances because you're doing it the right way in the first place. So let's move on into, uh, of course, uh, what hazardous attitudes can lead to. So obviously hazardous attitudes can put us in situations where weather is deteriorated or in combination perhaps with the situation we just saw before where it's nighttime because it doesn't even have to be low visibility or low ceilings it could be a low contrast situation low contrast obviously would be a night situation 
Um, so specifically though, we want to of course get into the mindset of our bodies. Uh, what I mean by that is what we, what we do every single day is so intuitive to us, uh, so natural that of course we don't even realize the signals being sent to our brain. So our spatial orientation system comprises of three uh, elements, our visual system, our vestibular system, and our somatosensory system. Um, these systems, of course, like I said, work very intuitively to us. It's as automatic as breathing. We don't even think about it. It's subconscious. And so that operation is very intuitive to us. And it works very well when we can see and when gravity is the only force acting on our bodies. But there lies in the problem, of course, is if we're flying in an airplane where we can't see because either we're in visibil uh, poor visibility, either we're in a reduced visibility due to mist, or maybe we're in thick fog, or we're in clouds, whatever the reason, or maybe in a combination with that, or maybe not. Maybe we're on an absolutely perfectly clear night, but we have no contrast because maybe we're flying over open water where there is no difference to the hue or any other aspect of the water in the sky. So you literally are flying in a black nothingness. There's, there's no up, there's no down. There's lots of different situations where therefore we can lose the ability to see and therefore use our visual system for orientation. And then we depend on our vestibular system and our somatosystem, uh, somatosensory system in order to get some orientation. The trouble with that is, those two systems, as I said, shortly are dependent really on gravity being the only working element in play. And clearly in an airplane, we can mess with gravity or mess also with the tilting of uh, the vestibular system. So let's jump over to the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge and take a look at uh, these systems. So we're going to go to chapter 17-6 <clears throat> and take a look there. Let me get some water. <coughs> Okay, so let's jump over to 17.6 and skip the table of contents this time. I should have created bookmarks, but I didn't. So I apologize. Let me slide over there. So in 17.6, this is a section that you certainly should read. Um, you don't need to be perfectly... Uh, in tune with the anatomy of the inner ear, but you should have a basic understanding of it. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the somatosensory system as well. And then we'll get into the illusions that are associated with these systems. So let's zoom into the bottom uh, picture here and just talk about a couple of things. So of course, in your inner ear, you have three semicircular canals that in fact work in the same axis element as we have pitch, roll, and yaw. Uh, these circular, semicircular canals basically, of course, give us that sensation of orientation by <clears throat> deflecting a fluid. Um, I always can't pronounce this in the length fluid with some type of tilt or load. So as we uh, tilt our heads back or if we pitch the nose up, we're going to deflect that fluid, and in turn, that fluid is going to deflect. Uh, hair cells on that cupola. I think that's how you pronounce it. And those those hair cells are attached to vestibular nerves, which in turn will send signals to our brain for orientation about uh, each axis. The trouble, of course, is, is that fluid has to move. And that's uh, wherein the, uh, the problem can lie, is if that fluid isn't engaged properly, or it begins to settle, and then we suddenly deflect it, then it gives us misinformation. Now, bear in mind, there's a secondary problem with this, and that is that in situations where you know you're kind of in over your head, um, you're in a situation you don't feel comfortable with, you can't see outside, and so what ends up happening is you have an inducement of these signals due to the fight or flight mechanism. So if you start to become anxious, right, what ends up happening is your body begins to release hormones because in a fight or flight situation, you want every sense, every nerve, every single sense of the brain to be in a heightened awareness. 
And so you're even more perceptive to those sensations. The problem is these sensations are going to be incorrect. So they're even more powerful, even more second nature, even more automatic, and all the more reason why you've got to be aware of them. So what we're really doing here is, yeah, you know, it, it's kind of a jack of all trades. We're learning a little bit about anatomy, but we're learning about the anatomy to give us a reason why. Specifically, all we can do tonight is talk about this really academically. We can talk about it, put it down on paper to make you aware that in reality, if you ever do encounter these sensations, you're hopefully aware enough of it to say, oh my gosh, this is this. And so in association, you'll respond to it by, of course, appropriately correcting by reference to your instruments. The key takeaway is though, is, is these sensations, these, these signals sent to your brain are so second nature, so automatic that lots of times you won't even recognize you're in that sensation until you realize the mismanagement. So the more aware you are of these types of illusions and the fact that these systems can be deceived, the more aware you're gonna be in those circumstances to be on the lookout for those types of uh, uh, disorientation illusions. The other thing we're gonna talk about shortly, of course, is your somatosensory system. It is not the same as the vestibular system or the inner ear uh, balancing system. The somatosensory system is simply, just think about it, you're, most of you are probably sitting down right now, if you close your eyes, you can tell you're seated, you're seated because of the force that the chair is exerting on the nerves in your legs, in your butt, if you're sitting on a, a seat back, then obviously the, the pressure in your back, as opposed to if you fell asleep and someone took you and hung you upside down and you woke up, even if you had a blindfold around your head, you could tell you're probably hanging upside down because gravity is pulling all the blood to the, to the top of your body, obviously, and so in association, you can feel that. That's your somatosensory system, as well as hearing uh, also as well. But here's the key takeaway, obviously. That's going to be dependent on gravity and no other loads fooling with that gravity and, and, and accompaniment. Guess what? We can definitely fool with gravity in an airplane. And so that's the key takeaway is the somatosensory system and the vestibular system can give you misinformation in certain situations, especially, obviously, when the visual system has nothing to go on because it's either just white outside or it's black outside. <clears throat> okay, let's jump back into our slides and take a look at a couple of different examples. <coughs> So these are the specific illusions that uh, I'm gonna get into. There are more than this, um, but these are the ones that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna take a look at them in the Pod's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, as well as show you where you can find them in the Aeronautical Information Manual. Um, we're not gonna discuss all at length as regard to what I've got tonight. I tried to use some basic simulator uh, 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 demonstrations that Aren't, aren't the best, but it is what I, I could get uh, together in time. So we're going to try to help you at least see what's going on um, in relationship to what you would feel. And that's kind of really the, the key is, is that you're going to have a almost a conflicting signal sent to your brain that causes uh, this disorientation. So the key takeaway, of course, is that each one of these illusions is either going to be dependent on the fact that your vestibular system is being fooled or your somatosensory system is being fooled, or both are being fooled. Also take away, and I'll reiterate this again a little bit later, that usually if you're encountering one illusion, it's very likely that you're not encountering that illusion alone. You could be encountering a couple of illusions simultaneously that obviously could create uh, some problems for you. So these illusions specifically are, of course, not the only illusions. There are other illusions, but these ones are the ones that specifically lead to spatial disorientation. Um, as I talked about before, we're learning them because you can't experience them, um, not, not at least in its entirety. Um, there are ways, of course, that you could perhaps intentionally go out and try to experience them in an airplane in a safe manner. Some of them you can kind of simulate uh, even in an office chair, um, but reality is most of these, the first time you're going to experience them is probably actually in actual conditions in an actual airplane. and so. If nothing else, we wanna talk about them extensively so that you're aware of them, just like I was. So I'll give you an example. The first time I experienced the leans was on the first time I was in my instrument reading training 
and I was flying for the first time in cumuliform clouds that were uh, creating a decent amount of uplifting turbulence. And without talking about the leans are, I was in that cloud, <coughs> excuse me, and suddenly I realized that my body was telling me that I was doing one thing when the instruments were absolutely in conflict with that. And it was unbelievable how powerful that sensation was and how automatic it was to me that I absolutely felt like I was doing something when in reality the instruments were telling me something else. And it, in that moment, I kind of laughed uh, even out loud to say, wow, this is the leans to really realize, like I said, it's one thing to, to see it on paper, to actually experience it in your body is an entire, uh, entirely different element. So we're gonna talk about the leans. We're gonna talk about Coriolis illusion. We're gonna at least make mention of the graveyard spiral. I'm not gonna spend too much, uh, sorry, spin. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. The spiral, we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, at length about the somatographic illusion, inversion illusion, and elevator illusion. I also have some actual uh, animations for a couple of these. I didn't uh, do all of them just for uh, time's sake. I might try to uh, create a video in the future that has better animations to at least at best kind of give some idea as the what kind of experiences you get in these types of circumstances. So let's jump back over to the Pots Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge first, going back to chapter 17, uh, jump into page six to take a look at these. And we'll read a little bit together there. Okay, so chapter 17, jumping over to uh, page actually it's going to start on seven so we'll jump there so i had made mention of leans what is the leans so let's just read a little bit together a condition called the leans is the most common illusion during flight and is caused by a sudden return to level flight following a gradual and prolonged turn that went unnoticed by the pilot so let's revert back to what we talked about before with those semicircular canals imagine you're in a prolonged turn maybe even not intentional Maybe you unintentionally roll into a turn and it was such a slow rate of turn, a roll, that it didn't, of course, uh, catch your eye or alert you uh, with your systems. So now you're in a prolonged turn or you inadvertently rolled into that turn, doesn't matter which. And in that circumstance, maybe you did recognize that you're in a turn. You looked at the instruments and you said, oh, I'm, I've turned 25 degrees away from my desired heading. And I turn back. Oh boy, here we go again. Okay, we're back. No, we're not. <laughs> uh, good grief. Give me. Talk amongst yourselves for like two minutes. Let me try to restart this iPad. I'll be right back. Okay, hopefully that did it. <clears throat> All right, so as we were saying uh, with the leans, the, the idea is basically for one reason or another, the fluid in that semicircular canal is is stable it's not deflecting the hairs and so in that situation even though you're in a turn your vestibular system is telling you your level and so when you level the wings because you recognize you've deviated on your heading suddenly you feel like you're banked in the opposite direction and that sensation is so powerful that in response the pilot may in fact simply put the airplane back in the original turn now that doesn't sound so bad but in reality if you go back and forth on this multiple times, which I've both experienced as well as seen as an instructor, then that can of course further aggravate into a deterioration, meaning things only get worse, they don't get better. And as I said before, you're not usually just encountering one illusion on its own, you start to encounter a multitude of them. So let's jump into the next illusion. The next illusion is the Coriolis illusion listed off here. This is a situation where you're in that same prolonged turn. Imagine you're in a prolonged turn and a movement of the head in that prolonged turn after the fluid in the inner ca uh, ear canal has now begun to move at the same speed as the canal. 
leads to moving that fluid in a different axis. So you have a load induced on the head. This oftentimes, by the way, happens in especially higher uh, G load type turns. Um, what ends up occurring is, is you get a sensation of a turn or an acceleration in an entirely different axis. Uh, this can be simulated, as I referred to before, with the office chair. You can have someone sit in an office chair that you can spin. You have them lean forward and turn their head in preferably the same direction you're going to spin the chair. And you spin the chair for at least like 30 seconds to a minute with their eyes closed. And then after that 30 seconds to a minute, you stop the chair, have them sit up. And so remember by sitting up, it's moved their head in a different axis and they turn their head forward to look straight ahead. Usually in that situation, they'll feel like they're tumbling backwards and most people will kind of grab the chair to, to keep themselves from tumbling over because that's the sensation they're having. This is comparable basically to the Coriolis illusion. Um, you could uh, see this also created uh, some fatality issues with low altitude uh, strafe runs. So military pilots will strafe a target, meaning they will basically do a low altitude pass, either uh, fire um, some type of uh, air to surface missile or drop uh, free falling bombs, whatever. And so they're doing that, of course, to make a high speed run to avoid being shot at. And when they execute that strafe, they also pull at a high load away from the ground and they turn a bit to get out of there quickly. And lots of times what pilots would do in that moment is they'd look back over their shoulder to check the, uh, the target. And in that situation, they'd encounter the Coriolis illusion and it led to, uh, to some crashes. So this is a situation where if you felt like you were tumbling backwards, you could push forward to, uh, to recover from what you think is a nose up pitching moment that of course could lead to a dangerous attitude. Um, another example where you can encounter this, just to kind of give you an idea, if you've ever been on like a centrifuge type ride, like I think at uh, yeah, um, Mission Space at Epcot, if you've ever ridden on that, they always tell you to put your head forward and look straight ahead. If, if you're ever on that ride, I don't recommend you do it, but if you want to experience this, if you lean forward to kind of look at your friend in a different seat, you will experience most likely the Coriolis illusion. It's very disorienting as well because your eyes can still see, but your brain is getting a mixed signal from this tumbling sensation. So it's almost kind of like rolling film. If any of you have ever watched those old uh, TV shows uh, where the, the, the picture would actually roll from top to bottom or bottom to top, that's kind of the sensation you get. So obviously imagine flying an airplane here. This could be quite disorienting. Um, <clears throat> graveyard spin, as I talked about, I'm going to, I don't have it here anyways at the moment. I'm going to skip ahead and go to the graveyard spiral. This is actually rooted in the leans. So the graveyard spiral has its relationship from the leans. It just progresses into something uh, much worse. And this oftentimes, in my opinion, is kind of the, the, uh, uh, the getter of the pilots, if you will. It's the one that kind of gets pilots in situations that lead to significant uh, uh, disorientation and loss of control. So let's just read through it. A pilot of prolonged coordinated constant rate turn. Same thing as the leans may experience the illusion of not turning, just like the leans. So then when they recover to level flight for whatever reason, they realize they deviated on their heading. Um, they're just doing it by feel. Whatever the reason, the pilot will then experience the sensation of turning in the opposite direction, causing the disoriented pilot to return the aircraft to its original turn. Now that may or may not happen. But oftentimes, if it does, then because an aircraft tends to lose altitude in those turns, unless the pilot compensates for the loss of lift, the pilot may notice a loss of altitude. So let's stop and talk about this and put this into perspective. The pilot, imagine you as the pilot, you're in a turn that you don't realize you're in for whatever reason, whether it's because you were in a turn the opposite direction and you tried to correct and you actually went into a turn back in the other direction, or maybe you went right back into the same turn. Irrespective of whatever the reason, you're in this turn without recognizing you're in this turn. You don't feel it. Um, you're, you're specifically paying subconscious attention to those signals that are being sent to your brain that you're, you're upright. And that's what you really want in this moment. You're, if you were flying at night and you can't see a thing outside, or if you were flying in instrument conditions and you can't see a thing outside, 
you're, you're nervous, you're anxious. And so in association, you're really focused on trying to make sure you're keeping the airplane upright and your body is telling you you're upright, but you're in a turn. Then finally, of course, maybe this turn gets so extreme that the banking is steep enough to where you start to lose a significant amount of altitude. Maybe you hear engine noise increase. Maybe you hear air, air rushing over the airplane. Uh, obviously, maybe you check the altimeter and you see a significant loss of altitude. In this situation, what ends up happening is you don't recognize you're in the turn, so the pilot may simply pull back on the controls in an attempt to stop the descent or to climb in this case. Because the banking was so steep, this back pressure actually tends to steepen the spiral to increase the loss of altitude. And that's why this illusion is referred to a graveyard spiral is because in fact, your rate of descent increases, the load increases on the airplane. You in fact don't recover from this because of how steep the bank angle was in this type of circumstance. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, the, uh, the crash of uh, JFK Jr., they at least think that this was likely the illusion that led to the, uh, the crash itself. <clears throat> You may be wondering, how do you recover from all of these things? Well, of course, you obviously get to that. We just want to talk about the illusions initially. Somatic graphic illusion is more in relation to, as you imagine, your somatosensory system. So this moves uh, not just from the, uh, the vestibular system, but also the somatosensory system to, as we see at the very top there, a rapid acceleration, such as an experience uh, during takeoff, stimulates the otolith organs in the same way as tilting the head backwards. You also feel, of course, those pressures in the same way that you would if you were pitching up, perhaps. So you feel the lows induced on your nerve endings in the same fashion, and that creates the illusion of pitching up or going up into a, a nose-up attitude. This, of course, especially happens in poor visual conditions, uh, particularly if you're entering a low-altitude cloud layer, for example. So as you would have guessed, the disoriented pilot, of course, pushed forward on the flight controls into a nose low attitude or perhaps a diving attitude. The opposite actually can, in fact, happen. Um, <clears throat> I've seen this myself. Maybe the first time you guys fly with a very nervous passenger, uh, maybe when you come up being the desired touchdown point, you close the throttle back. Not only the sound of the engine uh, being reduced, but also that initial deceleration they're so nervous that they're probably more sensitive to these sensations than you are. And so they'll oftentimes reach out and grab like the, the armrest because of how anxious that's great. Because in their, their bodies, what they're feeling is almost like a sinking sensation or a pitching down sensation as that deceleration occurs. So you can see as another example that in nervous circumstances, you're actually going to be more apt to subconsciously react to these, uh, these illusions than you would if you're comfortable and calm. So somatographic illusion, of course, is basically an acceleration or deceleration that leads to the illusion of an associated pitching up or pitching down or even maybe a, a, a ballooning or a sinking of the airplane as well. Lastly, two more, inversion illusion. That's an abrupt change from a climb. It doesn't have to be, by the way. It could actually be any attitude where you abruptly push forward on the controls. This stimulates the otolith organs uh, as well, again, is your somatosensory system enough to create the illusion of tumbling backwards. This is known as an inversion illusion. So the disordered pile in this case would actually keep pushing forward, <coughs> forward excuse me, into a nose low attitude, which unfortunately all that does is further aggravate the illusion. And then lastly, the elevator illusion is an abrupt upward vertical acceleration. Perhaps you're flying through an updraft, flying in a summer day over the, uh, the city, and so this otolith, uh, sorry, this updraft can stimulate the otolith organs and again, your somatosensory system and create the illusion of being in a climb. This is known as an elevator illusion. Of course, the disoriented pilot may push forward on the controls in a nose latitude. Another example is if you're flying through cumuliform clouds or you're flying through strong updrafts in those cumuliform clouds, this same uh, illusion can certainly uh, be created as well. The opposite can occur when you get a downward vertical acceleration in a downdraft. That could, of course, create an illusion of pitching down so you could accidentally put the airplane in a nose-up attitude. All of these sound simple enough, but bear in mind again, when people get themselves into VFR and IMC uh, situations where they're not trained for it, they're usually encountering a couple of these at any given point in time. And the longer you stay in those conditions, the more you're going to, of course, become fatigued emotionally, mentally, and physically because of course of how intense those circumstances are.
usually are. So obviously, the sooner you can get out of those conditions, or obviously, the earlier we can avoid them, uh, the better off we're going to be. Let's, uh, let's jump back into the slides and take a look at my, uh, my, <laughs> my examples, uh, which as, as, as I hope to, that they will do, the idea of course is to at least give you an idea of kind of what these would at least feel like in relation to what they look like. So this first one we're gonna talk about is the leans. So imagine you will, you're either inadvertently entered into a turn or you're in a prolonged turn to where no longer do you have some type of sensation in your inner ear. As far as you're concerned, your wings level. And then we're going to recognize, oh, we've been turning away from our desired heading. I've got to get back to wings level at least or turn back towards my heading. And then when I roll abruptly, I roll fast enough to where that does in fact influence the vestibular system to now make you feel like you're tilting. So what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a visual um, approximation of what you feel and what you're being, what, what 